Google this cat that's about to talk to you right now. Former worker for the NSA, scary three-letter word agency. Ooh, always done a lot of stuff, and is going to talk to you about some pretty cool stuff today. So, without any further ado, David Evanden. Oh, damn it! Did I pronounce it? Yes, yes. See, I'm full from lunch too. Round of applause for the gentleman all. Okay, can you hear me? Good, perfect. Uh, a few things, just right off the bat, that I'm bad at is this. So if I start to like drop the mic because I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing, um, just somebody like, hey, put the mic back up so we can hear what you're saying. I literally am not good at that, so I'm going to forget along the way. Um, I always get nervous whenever I talk, almost every single time, no matter how many times I talk. So if I get so nervous, I pass out. Just wait for me to stand back up. Um, and uh, we'll kind of go through. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, emulating an adversary while training defenders. Really what we're doing is auto magic. You know, implementation of being able to incorporate uh, the minor attack framework for uh, specific adversarial TTPs into a database, assigning those to known exploits in different systems. For instance, like if you were to do that within Metasploit, um, for, won't actually help you because it's going to get caught by every AV and EDR solution alive. But uh, if you're able to do that or some other type of system, um, CS for instance, you can do this in an automated way, automatic way. Uh, and, and I'll help you process forward. So we're going to kind of talk about a lot of the processes. We're going to go through a bunch of stuff. I talk really fast because I'm nervous. Um, so as we kind of go through there, if you guys have questions, also don't don't hesitate to uh, to interrupt me. I'm completely okay with that. And at the end, um, if we have other questions outside of this talk, there's a lot of things that I've done. For instance, if you guys have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them um, if I can. So, I'm a hacker, former linguist. I speak Persian Farsi. Um, I publish a bunch of books. Also, we have them sitting behind on the center counter. I published that with Lauren, uh, NetPlus, TechPlus, USA, Pentest Plus, uh, Forensics, and um, a couple of other different things. Uh, and uh, so, I'm a, I'm a founder. I own Standard User Cybersecurity. And um, I'm a finder. I love identifying new methodologies and, and, and protocols, practices in order to accomplish um, mundane tasks that nobody wants to do. Anytime that I can automate something so I can go to something else, 100%. Is my hat being on actually like bothering me? Okay, we got a thumbs up. Um, and also, I'm a new, I always consider myself new to our industry. You know, I've been here not very long. You know, if you guys probably do a comparison of how long you've been in this space, I probably haven't been here as long as you. Um, just sort of the road and the path to get me there uh, was very quick. Did it while I was in the service. So just a little bit of history of myself. Um, got my initial degree down in Wichita. Um, kind of in this space it was really great to kind of again even be invited back to this area. And then. Um, I joined the service, became a Persian linguist, transitioned out of that role as an defense intelligence operator for the NSA, went through a very uh, concise course where you're basically getting a bachelor's degree in six months, and then went up to the NSA for uh, three and a half, four years before moving overseas, working in conjunction with coalition forces to hunt and track ISIS and Al-Qaeda operatives, and um, ended up accidentally helping start a foreign intelligence service. Give a talk about a black hat this year. I'm also number 47 in Darknet Diaries and a bunch of other different um, sort of talks. Just a couple of days ago, um, Department of Justice issued three um, indictments for my former managers because of their turn and started working for the Foreign Intelligence Service. Well, we all fled the country and get back to the United States. Little hints just in there, kind of what my experience is. So now I help track foreign intelligence activity in USB's critical, critical infrastructure. And in doing so, one of the things that we're learning is, um, while this is sort of antithetical to my talk, is specific targeting and identification and training towards uh, TTPs as they relate to different actors. It's not actually that helpful if you don't have funding behind it in order to support it. Um, I think Jacob talked about that this morning. Uh, in the uh, opening talk, which was phenomenal. In fact, I asked him if he would mind if I just took a couple of his slides and put them in mine. So I have, because I think that reinforcement of those ideas is, is, is really powerful. This is a fun exercise, something that you can do. There's a lot of open source technologies that are that are out there that you can use in order to do it. That's just what I did. You know, we didn't really write anything new. We just use existing stuff. But you can automate the entire process, defending our uh, training defenders on how to identify and mitigate, remediate, and alert, just an entire pipeline. 
um, for specific APTs and TCPs and target sets. So, outline, we're gonna go through purple team modeling, red team engagement life cycles, threat actor modeling with minor attack, um, uh, Metasploit module modeling, blue team post engagement and security post, um, security posture modeling, and then uh, purple team synergy. These are just titles that I can come up with the best thing of what I think this might relate to. Um, we'll kind of get there as we go. Uh, so this is really like a, a main focus on what, obviously you guys can think of what purple team modeling might be. Uh, some of this talk is really designed for people that might even be in this space that high school students, um, college students that may have never been introduced to this. So this may not be new information for you, because uh, you might know red team is offensive in nature, blue team is defensive in nature, and purple team is collaborative. Kind of makes sense. Um, so moving through, so red team engagement life cycles, really, it, it, and, and again, what we're talking about is in the event that your job is to identify um, vulnerabilities and uh, attack those vulnerabilities within, say, your scope or your environment. Uh, scoping, planning, and then rules of engagement, building those for an internal infrastructure, even if you're, say, an MSSP, you're doing that for a third party. These are really important aspects of what you're doing. Rules of engagement, incredibly important. If you go outside the boundaries of the rules, rules of engagement as an MSSP, and you break something, you're gonna, you know, you could potentially be in a lot of trouble. Uh, there are all kinds of things, you know, identification clauses and whatnot, so in the event that we do something, we break something, we're not gonna be responsible for that. So ensuring that those are built in, you actually have rules, and that even if they like give you the IP addresses, hey, you're gonna be targeting 15 IP addresses, here they are, go just make sure they know what they're talking about, that they didn't just pull these IP addresses somewhere. These, these belonged to us five years ago, but they don't belong to us anymore. You better go check before you gain access to it. Um, so recon, so in that former recon, attack, foothold, internal recon, lateral movement, uh, target uh, critical data, and then export that data. So as we kind of go through that, I'll talk a little bit more about, I'll go very specifically through the exploitation lifecycle stages of red team and pen testing, and then I'll walk through why we at the Standard User Institute um, focus on how to mitigate that lifecycle, which is really just work in reverse. But first, here for instance is just sort of a good uh, red team engagement lifecycle for rules of engagement. In the event that you guys don't know what should be in the rules of engagement, one, ask someone, Google something, look at a, somebody else's SOW to identify what that is. Because this is your CYA card that's going to allow for you to protect yourself. Um, well, actually, let's, let's kind of go through it. So really what you're going to do is you're going to like develop off-limits list. Don't, don't target these. These are your key devices list. This is your specific critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure sometimes is that infrastructure where we want you to target this and make sure that it's secure. Sometimes that critical infrastructure is don't touch this. This is absolutely off-limits. So while we have an off-limits list, really the critical infrastructure is absolutely off-limits. And then uh, sensitive data in the event that you do identify or, or have access to sensitive data, you are not allowed to download it off of the target system. You just need to verify that you actually have been there to get a small screenshot of a file name or something similar to that. And then uh, approved hours of operations. Lots of times if you're doing large scale scanning or operations against a production environment, pardon me, uh, they don't want you doing that during working hours or sometimes they do want you doing that during working hours so in the event that you do accidentally take something down, they can train and model and identify where their gaps are within their system for uh, remediation for down systems, for instance. Again, that's something else Jacob talked about earlier, about putting in some specific key elements into production environments to see if you invent, you pulled this plug or took down a system, you know, what's your continuous, continuous uptime. So again, talking about sort of the pen test methodologies or the um, exploitation lifecycle, this isn't really our exploitation lifecycle, we have a different image for that. Um, but a pretty good large scale overview. Uh, recon, target, breach, persistence, migration, and exfiltration. What we're talking about here is in the event that you have an external um, target and they give you just the company name, how can you go through the process of performing external uh, reconnaissance against that organization? What tool sets are out there? What open source uh, websites are out there where you can put in that company name or some variation of that company name and identify the infrastructure that's owned by that company? And then from the uh, perspective of owning, identifying what infrastructure is owned by it, now you're going to start the process of scanning it, identifying those vulnerabilities, identifying uh, 
key gap within their security posture that you can export and gain access. Once you do that, now you have target breach, which is really once you identify a vulnerability on a target that's owned by the client, now you're gonna throw a specific exploit and gain remote access, interactive um, access to that. There are different aspects of access to something. You can have long-term persistence access, which is you know, beaconing agents, not exactly interactive. And then you do have IO or interactive operations against remote target. So for instance, in the event you're typing on a keyboard and it's running against a remote target, that's interactive. Uh, in the event that it's calling back and no one's interacting with that, it's just storing the content and then going back to sleep, that's you know, uh, a hibernation agent or a persistence methodology. We're not gonna necessarily go into right now within this talk, if you guys have questions afterwards just so we can get through everything. Uh, we won't necessarily go into persistence methodologies, but I'm happy to talk about that afterwards. Uh, but in the event that you don't know what persistence is, so let's just say you gain access to a system because you've thrown an exploit, and that exploit in two weeks is gonna get patched or it has been patched, and you know it's they have a maintenance window in two weeks in order to solve that problem. You don't wanna rely on that exploit to gain access to the environment every single time. So you install some kind of persistence within the environment that allows you to call back and communicate with some C2 platform. C2 platform would be command and control. So uh, it calls back whether or not directly or through some type of actor owned relay or victimized relay and uh, communicates with the C2 server to run specific commands or just check in or whatever it might be doing. And then migration, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you're fantastically amazing, you're not gonna gain initial access to your target and the specific target machine inside of that environment in the same host. You're gonna gain access to some low-hanging fruit and then you're gonna to have to move throughout the environment in order to gain access to the target that you wanna exfil data from. Exfiltration is um, really identifying a specific piece of data, whatever your end goal is that they've hired you to do, and then pull that information out. Okay, so um, this is, uh, I guess walking through that same process is uh, scoping, scanning, vulnerability identification, exploitation, post-exploitation, lateral movement, and stealing of critical data. So again, just everything we kind of went over. Um, the next thing we're gonna talk about is threat actor modeling with MITRE ATT&CK. This is really gonna go into the pen test methodologies that all kind of come back together. I know it feels like that we're talking about separate things, but at the very end, we'll kind of go into there. It's really important kind of over here, again, with uh, what Jacob Torrey talked about this morning, kind of one of the, some of the things that are good to train defenders on are some of the new methodologies and techniques that actors are actively using in an environment. In the event that you're using very old TTPs and some you know, database that you guys downloaded and stored 25 years ago, it's probably not gonna help you if you're continuing to do that. You have to use updated, you know, um, artificial intelligence machine models against, uh, against an environment in order to better train defenders. Again, if you're doing it, you just have the scope and you don't have the money in order to do it well, you don't have the money to like take everyone offline in order to train them, you're just doing it as a regular exercise. As a regular exercise is fun, but probably not helping a whole lot of people. Um, so again, we're gonna go through programmatic access to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, actor te technique mapping. It's important to note, I don't know if you guys have ever used the MITRE ATT&CK framework, I mean, I'm sure that there's quite a few people here that use the UI for programmatic access to be able to store that content in the localized database, and then access that content or map it as it relates to uh, Metasploit modules, Cobalt Strike modules, something similar to that, and then being able to hit, I wanna replicate this particular actor and then hit enter, and then that's the entire platform does that job. It's only gonna pretend to be this particular actor set. Um, so active to industry mapping, so in the event also, I wanna do this and I wanna pretend to be, say for instance, you're an MSSP and you're building the platform in order to work against a bunch of different clients, you don't want it to build it just to work against finance. You know, you wanna finance energy, you know, uh, div organization, so on and so forth. So you can go to the actor specifically and then drop down and go specifically to the industry. And then object-oriented database storage technique to MSF module mapping. Now the object-oriented storage, that's important because you're accessing large amounts of data in order to throw specific exploits very quickly. So if you can index that data and access it, index it across multiple different databases, it's gonna run a lot faster, you're gonna need less resources. Okay, so in uh, threat actor uh, modeling uh, in minor attack, it's just important to understand how much data is in their uh, system. They have a ton of data. 
We need to kind of sift through it and understand what's in there. In the event that we want to use a Python module in order to do this, that's pre-existing. We can show you what that is and give you access to that. It's pretty easy to do. Um, it's easy to do now that the Python module is written. Um, and uh, so kind of coming back through here, understanding, recognizing that data exfiltration, recon, breach, migration, and persistence are all built into the minor attack model. Now, those are just those top level subject matters. You kind of rotate into the, um, the outer ring, and those fall down into those specific TTPs of what actor groups might do something in a different way. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so again, this is, uh, you know, you're just basically like pulling down uh, sticks to modules, uh, pulling in the CTI enterprise attack framework module, pulling in the database, storing it in this situation, I'm storing in FS, and then down here I'm just using list comprehensions in order to build new uh, lists uh, in order to store that content for use later after I'm able to map it with uh, Metasport processes. I know we're gonna, this is kind of unorthodox, but right now, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, do it. Yeah, I'm confused. So if I'm hacking someone's uh, for business or something like that, can I use that person's uh, clientele as well to have to trade their site? Or is that okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. I actually stopped becoming a linguist because I can't hear very well. So you're going to have to just project a yeah. little more. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, if I hack a client's um, server, sorry. If I use, a, say I have like a person's email address from a client or something like that, and I, give them, and I make a fake email and stuff like that and send them, and I gain access to the system through that, is that considered an infiltration or is that just considered, uh, what is it called? Do, do I infiltrate them and then, sorry, I had this phrase in my head not. That's okay, I'm going to ask you to restate it again, and then you just lost it, I'm sorry about that. No. So have you gained access, or is it that persistence, or? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So he's basically asking, it sounds like what you're talking about is external infrastructure, and you're scanning stuff and gaining access to a known vulnerability or a default password or something similar to that. If I send a phishing campaign, uh, create some type of an email address, and then they interact with that and gain access, is that also initial access? 100%. It's also initial access, you just perform that in a different way. Um, the, the, I would say the actor to TP modeling that would happen in that case is what are you using in order to manipulate the end user in order to interact with your content? Am I using some type of .bin or a macro embedded Microsoft Word document or PDF document? Or am I sending them some type of an email? Or am I targeting one of their, their existing clients? Say for instance watering hole or drive-by attack and I, this is my target, but I don't want to gain access to them. We're kind of getting outside of offensive security and into offensive intelligence in that conversation, but um, because generally speaking in offensive intelligence, you're not going to actually target your target. Um, you're not going to hack your target. You're going to hack somebody that you do business with and wait for them to browse their website or wait for them to go somewhere else and then gain access to them, and all you've done is just created an exploitation chain that looks exactly like what they're existing doing, what they're already doing. But yes, initial access via um, a vision campaign is also initial access. And you can install persistence, migration, the whole process begins at that point. Does that answer your question? Yeah, actually, that's exactly what I was wondering. Cool, perfect. That's kind of what I was thinking that we were asking, but I just wanted to get that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the, so when you're talking about minor attack, I'm familiar with the framework. I'm not familiar with uh, actual command line tools that uh, uh, help like emulate. Yeah. Uh, so, so is this something provided by Miner? Is it just called Miner? Is that what Miner Attack is? Uh... NSF modeling and pairing that with Miner. That's literally the next step of what we're going to talk about. I appreciate you paying attention and keeping up. I do apologize for not actually addressing that before we got to this spot. I will tell you in the C2 platform there's a lot of open source framework. Um, that uh, diligent script kitties, I would say that I'm a diligent script kitty. I'm good at what I do, but I'm using export C2 platforms that are developed by somebody else. Um, so I'm not writing any of my own exploits or anything like that. I have no, I have no CVEs today, and chances are I'm gonna die with no CVEs because it's just not my area of expertise. Um, but Metasploit, Cobalt Strike, all of those platforms are pla platforms that you can integrate programmatically with the MitreTech framework in order to pair that information together. So we'll talk about that right now. 
Before we continue, any other questions? I'll get up with Sue. Oh, we're already here. Okay, so uh, really what we're doing is, again, pairing information with uh, known modules. So within the um, Metasploit framework, there's uh, initial exploitation, which is at the very top. You might even have auxiliary, which is uh, like scanning infrastructure. Um, you might have a specific payload and then post-exploitation. In the event that you've never done offensive anything, let's go ahead and walk through these really quickly. So if I am doing like stage one, I'm performing reconnaissance, I'm scanning. I'm doing some type of auxiliary where I'm scanning something. I might want to DAW something. I might want to see if there's some type of spoofed or, uh, spoofed or information gathering of specific targets. Are there any default admin portions of that where I can scan against a remote target and identify something and gain access without actually having to throw an exploit? Or scanning to identify some type of vulnerability that might pair with a known uh, Metasploit module. Once I identify what that is, I have to shift over within the Metasploit framework and use an exploit. You use an exploit and pair that with a payload. What does that mean? It means I'm throwing an exploit, injecting something into memory in order to get it to manipulate and do whatever it is I want, and then I'm replacing a piece of memory address space with some type of shell code that I want to run. That shell code is going to be a payload, kind of loosely interchanging terminology here because it's it is important, but and for this case, it's not that important. In the event that you're an exploit developer and I'm interchanging payloads and um, shellcode, and you hate me, I apologize. Um, but really, you're using a, a payload in order to, might be a multi-stage payload, that then you're going to gain interactive access to remote target during that chain. Once you do that, and you want to run something else on top of that, I'm going to know who's on the machine, I want to gather a bunch of stuff. I want to just perform um, integrated scanning against remote or adjacent infrastructure. That's where you fall into post-exploitation models. I'm going to run something. I want to gather some stuff. You can also run auxiliary modules um, in that as well. So you want to gain or you want to gather. So auxiliary gather. In the event that you gain access to a system, you want to pull that information. You can do that with that module. Excuse me. Um, so. This is how you, okay, so let me just have to talk about that. I, I don't really have a screenshot of the Metasploit framework by itself, which is kind of a lapse on my part, because this is sort of moving into the next stage of that. So Kali is a common um, virtual machine used that has Metasploit on it, where you can just download the ISO, load it as a virtual machine, and now you have Metasploit on there. Um, in the event that you do that, uh, you can just drop to a shell, run MSF console, uh, once you do that, you can use use and help and search and the, all the other things I just talked about. In the event that you don't want to do that or you don't want to be interactive on a machine, you can actually run MSF console and then walk away from it and then interact with that MSF console remotely. So you can pull everything down, I can run commands, I can run exploits, whatever it is I want to do. You can do it on the same machine, you can do it on remote machines. If you want to do it from against remote machine, you actually have to go into the MSM console or Metasploit framework and make a few adjustments so that these ports are accessible remotely. Um, so once you do that, you can actually drop into a remote um, Postgres, Postgres connector, PostSQL, and then um, connect to it and pull information down. Or let's just say, for instance, you um, you have like a Nessus scanner or something similar to that, you want to take your Nessus results and push them over to a Metasploit framework to actively throw an exploit to gain access, you can do that. In the same process here, you can actually do this on some centralized Python where you're pulling MITRE attack framework in, you're pulling all the modules down, and then syncing them together, and then as you're scanning in a different module using something like Nmap, you can do that from there. So for instance, if I were to do that here and I were to run that, I can pull all the information down based on the full name or path name, the ID, the details, and then the operating system that it might run against. There's a ton of other information in here. This is obviously just like four little rows or columns. Um, but there's so much information that as you're scanning something, you can pull back those scans of information, sync them with a known exploit, map those exploits with a TTP, and then now you know specifically in this environment what actor is using what, and what within my environment might be vulnerable to what they're using. And then you launch them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Any other questions? Okay, let's go. Okay, so uh, manual request is something that we wrote just for fun, and ended up being like 
this process. It's extremely dangerous and it doesn't actually make sense to release it in the wall. If you want access to that just because you're a verified researcher and you're not going to use it for something nefarious, I'm happy to let you use it. But in the event that you're going to use it for something that's going to be ridiculous, I'm happy to teach you the processes, but I'm not going to give this to you. Um, so the process here is what it does is target identification. I've gone outside the wall, I've got a bunch of like IP addresses. You can also do this automatically with known open source software. So it's not a manual process of identifying the IP addresses corresponding to a specific organization. And then you're pulling that information in, you're loading it into a Python Nmap module, you're scanning that information, storing it into its own database, uh, vulnerability discovery, syncing that information for as vulnerabilities in open source platforms, pulling that information back in with um, Metasploit module mapping, and then initiating MSF MSFRPC console module, which is the remote access to Metasploit, and then from there, mapping them to actor known infrastructure, and then mapping things based on specific actor that you want to emulate. Hopefully that kind of makes sense, I went through that pretty fast. Good. Okay, so, um, so in here, really we're kind of dropping down into an MMAP port scan, processing through, um, you can like kind of change up your arguments over here, whatever you want to run, and then you're processing through your uh, targets, pulling back OS match, class, family, um, ports, the entire process, and then eventually, after you kind of get down this process here, mapping those against the other columns in the Metasploit framework, and then syncing that information with the MITRE type framework to launch exploits as they relate to a specific actor. Okay, still here, we're kind of in the same process here. We're kind of just jumping over to different spots, but we're scanning, identifying that information, running back down, and then running, in this case, for initial access. Once you gain to initial access, I would say a uh, large number of um, organizations that are not white hat but offensive in nature. Initial access um, is automated, so you're gonna run some, some type of survey or situational awareness script. Um, for instance, I think, we actually have a copy of one right here. Um, so what this right here does is, uh, I think that's right, let me just take a look at this, make sure I'm not lying here. Um, yeah, 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 so right here. So you can actually like drop down and run a file write series of commands like you know, command, host name, whatever it might be, and then just do like a little array. There's a uh, Metasploit module for custom scripting that exists. It's a survey script. You can just change it up, do whatever you want. Uh, we actually have that that particular one. Just run stuff and prints it out to the screen. You can edit that where it the output of those commands are written to a disk, or you can um, interact with a remote database and store that for long-term storage. Basically, what that means is in the event that you do receive a callback and it's automated, and no one is there at three o'clock in the morning to watch the output of what those commands are, but I'd like to know what they are tomorrow when I come into work. Um, you can just store that information in some type of database, come in, you know what it's done, it's gone back to sleep, but you actually see the output of those commands, and I know that Mark is always on this computer, but for whatever reason, Bob, the domain administrator, enterprise administrator, logged on this computer last night. Why did he do that? Is he on to me? Whatever it might be. So, um, just sort of long-term access to uh, long-term C2 embedded agents. There is a, uh, Praetorian has actually a really good um, attack automation for purple teaming out there. Uh, and they, uh, down here, Praetorian, it's a vlog getting started with Praetorian's attack automation. They have a really good walkthrough and a couple of videos and a GitHub link to something you can get started in this process. Again, nothing that we did here, even though it's kind of a lot of work, nothing we did here is anything that we did on our own. You know, you want to use a Python C2 instead of interpreter, go get puppy. You know, whatever it might be that you want to do, there's stuff out there. Okay, so how does this help defenders or blue teams in the end? Really allowing for them to understand, I, I would tell you that the, one of the primary um, capabilities of a defending team is visibility. In the event that they can see what's happening in their environment, they're going to be successful in the event that they can't see what's happening in their environment, they're absolutely not going to be successful. If you can't see what's going on, you can't stop anything, you can't block anything, you can't help anything, you can't load on anything. So increasing visibility and increasing the identification of malicious activity within that visibility is how you help and train defenders. So what does that mean? Basically it means like if I do gain access to a remote environment and a new operating or a new process comes up on a remote machine somewhere, and I have some type of EDR solution, or antivirus, EDR, endpoint detection and response, 
antivirus, and everybody, I think everybody knows what an antivirus is. And so it's mapping or it's, it's processing or it's, it's keeping track of what processes are on there. And those launch back and it generates an alert and that alert comes back to me. Or somehow I've been able to identify a new process that doesn't get flagged by their EDR solution. But I run commands, SMB commands from workstation to workstation. Workstation to workstation, SMB command should automatically flag an alert. You should know that why, why, why does someone need to be doing this? There's no reason for people to be using 445 across workstations. That's, that's um, vertical and not lateral movement uh, activity. So in the event that they can't see, you don't have any type of internal to internal firewall, which might go back to work tomorrow or they say Saturday, um, go back to work on Monday and be like, hey, what kind of internal to internal lateral movement visibility do we have in our environment? And we're like, why are you asking these questions? Because we have no visibility here. Okay, sure, let's have a conversation about that. Chances are, if it's an existing company, long, long-term existing company with a good stack, they're gonna know that they have that visibility gap and that there might be something in the roadmap in order to solve it, or there might not be. And you asking those questions is ultimately gonna help long-term. One thing that I will tell you is using the MITRE attack framework in order to train defenders alone, it's not a good solution. This is where you're starting, start somewhere else. Because it's not a good spot to start. It's for training defenders that understand and already have visibility within their environment. We want to, we want to test our incident response time. We want to test different types of stages from that process. Again, Jake and Corey sort of re-emphasized this. You know, trying to make um, partial programs and multiple games well, I'm sorry, uh, partial progress in multiple games simultaneously really is you're going to ultimately fail. If you're doing this over here, trying to increase visibility, and you're also trying to train our instant response at the same time, fix your visi visibility problems, and then email me later, and we'll help you get it going up what you got done. Some of these other sections are understanding like internal processes. This is more like education, um, kind of really boring, but. Um, you know, understanding sort of the life cycle of within an environment, what are the, some of the key aspects that you need? Asset management, I don't actually know that IOCs is one of those first things, but implementing good leadership in a place with good experience is gonna help you move forward. Um, firewalls, perimeter controls, experience of uh, leadership, um, AV, uh, EDR solution, visibility, integrated partners, nice sims, and ultimately teamwork. So. Um, I actually am a, I'm a strong believer. You know, we have a, a separate security firm, but we also have an institute. Everybody that works or works on assessments, pen tests, whatever it might be, um, at the firm has to also, they're also required to teach. If you're not teaching the next stage of people, the only next gen that actually matters, uh, then we're not really helping anyone. So teaching that next stage and, and reinforcing that knowledge gap, um, to that, that next series is really going to make them better at what they do, ultimately, but it's going to reinforce the leadership that your team already has. They have that, that leadership by teaching those other people, it reinforces and gives them confidence in their space and builds community, uh, at, especially as those people go off and work somewhere else. So we have a 90-day internship program, and um, if you guys have questions about that, about building a cybersecurity internship program at your organization, happy to have that conversation too. Um, so other cybersecurity framework versions, I, you know, identify, protect, attack, respond. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm like quoting Octonauts right now when I say that. Um, I don't know if you guys watch Octonauts. No one laughs. No one, no one here has any kids. Um, protect, attack, respond, recover. So um, identify critical assets within your environment and put key personnel in place in order to protect them. Enable enterprise security. Close visibility gaps. Implement and train response. Implement and train based on response plans. Configure proper backups. Lean on professional security services and business continuity programs. Okay, here is my last slide. Let's see how fast I talked. That's okay. Um, so if this right here is the exploitation or the pen testing lifecycle, my initial suggestion is to work backwards. If someone's going to exfil data, if there's, this is the key bit of element or piece inside of your environment that's like the keys of the kingdom, and I'll tell you, domain administrative privileges are not the answer to that because who cares if you got it? If you're stealing critical data, PII, passwords, credit card information, that's the important data in your environment, and that's what we're talking about here, is identify critical data. Identify critical data in your environment. What do you have? Where is it at? And who can see it? Answer those three questions. These machines have access to this? Why? 
close this access down. They, nobody needs to be lo remotely logging into all of our credit card systems. Um, so network visibility, who has access to that? Host visibility, what's happening on our hosts? Why are things changing and manipulating? You know, I think Jacob Tory also earlier today talked about his time at DARPA in uh, using basically similar types of processes and interacting with them. I, mean, I don't understand everything he was talking about, but I kind of do, but I can't replicate it. Um, where if you interact with the heap or stack within a process and it makes different types of changes over time, it, it means that that's the structure of the process. So if the structure of your processes on your operating systems are changing, working slower, you know, um, everything seems to be convoluted all the time, maybe you need to do a little bit of research, understanding what's happening and, and increasing your host visibility within your environment would be critically helpful. Perimeter visibility, so what's on the external of your environment, what do you have out there? If you have something out there and you forgot about it, that's probably a pretty big issue. You need to go take it down because it's not being updated, it's not being patched, and it has direct access inside of your environment. OSINT visibility, in fact, there's an OSINT um, workshop, I think is what we call it, or um, here. I think that's a really great spot to go to. I think um, understanding open source intelligence and how that can help you understand like what's out there. If you have developers on your team, for instance, I'm just gonna throw developers out because I have a Java developer on our team who I love, but I hate Java, so I always give them a hard time. Um, writing in like different blogs, everybody knows that he works with this company, he's going out there and he can't figure out, hey, we have this external piece of infrastructure, he doesn't actually do this. But we have this external piece of infrastructure and he can't figure out you know, how to get this to work. How do I use this or get this particular module to work on this operating system? Well, what module are you using? What operating system are you using? What's your most recent patch? Well, guess what you've just done? You just gained an adversary, every single bit of information about your externally hosted infrastructure that as soon as a vulnerability comes out, they can just keep track of that and launch it at your target and gain access. Just keeping in mind that if you're posting information on Stack Overflow and different types of questions, rein it in. Uh, and then so after you get all of this information back together, performing risk uh, determination about where to start and how to help. Okay, that's everything we've gone through. A little bit out of breath, but I talk so fast. But um, what else we got? I can go back and forth to different slides or we can ask questions about other stuff. Um, just kind of depends. Yes? Uh, you had mentioned that there shouldn't be SMB access laterally. Uh, would that apply to like Windows admin shares? Uh, those Windows admin shares would be from a workstation to another workstation? Correct. Hypothetically, I'm not saying like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah do that's this, okay. But. I mean, I, I would just, I would just want to know what the use case for those Windows admin shares are before I would give a definitive answer on that. You know, are they sharing stuff back and forth? If that's the case, why are they storing something on a file server somewhere? Mm -hmm. So I guess that, those would be my questions. But if you were asking me that question, say, hey, we need this open, I'd be like, well, no, you need to do it like this instead. What else we got? Yes. Have you found that involving your policy? If you found that involving your policy team when developing out your purple team has been super helpful, especially because you're using an attack framework that is based off of MITRE, which also has the blue team attack framework too, or the blue team framework. Yeah, so when you're saying, uh, have you found that uh, involving your policy team uh, helps when working in conjunction with multiple departments within your environment? Is that your question, basically, yeah. Um, and within policy, you mean like, how are we interacting with, or what is like within that aspect of policy? Yes, like implementing specific mandates, you have to do it like this, you have to help with this, or once you identify this and you have a specific SLA in order to perform this action, or NIST frameworks need to be implemented or so on and so forth, you have to do that. If you're not in, including um, policy or legal in these processes, ultimately, that team is gonna leave that's learned all this stuff, and you're gonna have to start from ground zero when the new team comes in. What else we got? Did I, I'm sorry, did I answer that question? Do you feel like, okay, good. Any other questions here? Yes, sir, again. Uh, do you? You yeah, have. Go yeah, I'm yeah. uh, Do you, so, so this question is again uh, in relation to kind of the automation around, uh, you know, using Metasploit to emulate an adversary. Yeah. How do you correlate this adversary uses these Metasploit models? Like, is this just, you may have mentioned it in the, in yeah. the So that's actually a really good um, question, and the distinction there would be that I would tell you adversaries are not using Metasploit modules. 
Um, they're using customized framework that are associated with specific TTPs, which those TTPs are, they're launching these types of exploits. They're hitting Java, they're hitting solar winds, whatever it might be. But they're still doing this, we're still doing that. There are Metasploit modules to attack those same pieces of framework. Um, so understanding what they're attacking and how they're doing it and the different processes that they're doing, then you're mapping those TTPs to something in the wall or in the uh, open source community that you can leverage. May not necessarily be Metasploit, but it's just a really good, easy uh, framework to take on. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's just open source intelligence to figure out what the TTPs are and then you build your automation around I would tell you that minor attack has made that okay. open source intelligence, but generally speaking, the answer to that is no. You know, I work in a lot of programs in conjunction with uh, Alphabet Soup, if you will, um, that give different uh, intelligence to actor organizations and what type of uh, TTPs they're leveraging. But minor tech framework, because of the open source community anonymously providing different information, being able to broadcast that back out for open source information sharing has been incredibly helpful in the development of something like the minor tech framework. Yeah, totally answers my question. Thanks. Cool, great, perfect. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I appreciate your presentation. Obviously, this is an advanced field. I guess my question is, I assume that for a company that doesn't already have this type of talent and skill set in-house is going to be outsourcing, you know, for services. So my question is, at what point would an organization be smart to, uh, what criteria, what threshold would they pass where they would want to have some of this uh, capabilities kind of in-house on a permanent basis? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to pull a Katie Nichols answer, and it depends. Um, <laughs> it really just depends on what the maturity of their stack is. That uh, Everybody here has a question, at what point are you hiring an external MSSP in order to perform these adversary emulations or pen test against you? At what point do you convert that over and start doing that yourself? Um, I would say you, uh, it's a specific threshold of what you're doing. If you haven't hit a specific mark yet, continuous monitoring, uh, you know, integrated deployed enterprise-wide EDR solutions, uh, vulnerability scanning, vulnerability assessment, to begin holistically with asset management. What do I have in my environment? If you don't know what you have in your environment, you shouldn't be trying to test all of it. You need to be like identifying, scoping, understanding what you have there. And then as you understand what you have there, scoping that out on like smaller scales, as you're working with remote teams to perform vulnerability identification in your system, and then even performing pen tests in your environment, um, to understand those visibility gaps while you're maturing on the inside, and then as soon as you come up and you begin to understand all of those results that they're sending in, you say, okay, I feel like I can start producing some of this myself, um, but I'm only two people, so we don't have the time to do this, nor do we have the funding to do this. Even though you can do it, the answer is you still shouldn't do it um, until you do have the resources and funding and the expertise and maturity within your stack in order to perform those actions. I guess that's the, that would be my answer. So it just still does depend, but it depends on where you're sitting. Resources, funding, maturity, and expertise. Welcome to Impulse. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? In the back. I'm going to wait for this. Thank you. Yeah. Lunch is slowing down. <laughs> uh, do you see these groups quickly changing or adapting new TTPs uh, once they've been profiled, or do they kind of stick with those for quite a while? Regardless. Yeah, um, I will tell you um, that people on our side of the fence know the people on the other side of the fence intimately. You know, we know who they are, we know where they work, where they're getting training at, where they put their file paths, where they're getting access to remote machines, how what their naming conventions are for their executables, specifically for Doug or Bob or replace that with a Chinese or Russian name. You know, we know when they go to a training and they're learning this new concept at a training within four to six months or up to 18 months, we might see that new TTP start to be used. So um, yes, they are, they do move. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, we, do, uh, we do start to see those changes within TTPs over time, but until adversary um, personnel on teams move or take other training, 
lots of times you'll just use that same stuff for long periods of time. We start to see changes in management, changes in personnel. You can anticipate changes in tactics. Yes? Don't make it work for it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the mic. Say I'm a small company and I only have a limited amount of funds for smart people. Uh, and I want to go for a pen test, which pen test am I going to choose? Web app, internal, or external? It depends. <laughs> um, it depends on what you have, where is it at, and who can see it. So do I have proprietary configured or uh, developed software that has been developed in-house and we're hosting that externally? I will tell you that if that's the case and that stuff has not been assessed yet, you need to start there. Um, you develop things in-house, you don't have you know, secure coding best practices implemented internally, you're not performing DAS or SAS solutions against those or assessments against those, that's step one. Um, in the event that you're not developing that, let's just say for instance you're an energy company and you're not developing anything internally, um, I don't have any idea where it works, so if you happen to work in an energy company, that's just a good guess. Um, but you're doing that, you're not developing any of your own stuff, and you're just using third-party infrastructure, um, some type of externally hosted infrastructure, uh, pen test would be a good place to start. Um, but also keep in mind that uh, majority of you know attacks nowadays in small and medium businesses do happen based on phishing campaigns, uh, where you're interacting with something, or somebody browsing something, and you hit a web browser. Uh, so vulnerability scanning against targets is a, is a good step. So setting up a necessary internally, you could do that yourself, depending on how much you've learned. Uh, $2,500, you can do that. You can scan your entire infrastructure as long as you can understand the difference between a false positive and a non-false positive. And then uh, implement severity, uh, severity against those results and begin that way. So that's one step you can do that internally. In the event that you're hiring somebody, an outsider, I would start outside. But again, it depends on what you have and where is it hosted. Any other questions? All right. Hey, guys, thank you so much. Appreciate your uh, attention, and uh, you guys have a great day.